in the 21st chapter of the Westminster Confession of Faith, that's the, the confession that our denomination subscribes to, it states in paragraph 7, as it is the law of nature that in general a due proportion of time be set apart for the worship of God, so in his word by a positive, moral and perpetual commandment binding all men in all ages, he has particularly appointed one day in seven for a Sabbath to be kept holy unto him. Now, our confession is doing a few things there. First of all, there it's, it's emphasizing this principle of Sabbath keeping, keeping one day in seven set apart for God. It emphasizes that that is a law of nature. That is, it's something that's always been God setting apart that day right at the creation. It, it emphasizes that it's part of God's moral law, which of course never changes because morality never changes. And therefore, Sabbath keeping is binding upon all men in all ages. We dealt with a lot of that theme last time. Now, the day which was set apart throughout Old Testament times was the last day of the week, which we would call Saturday. And yet today, it's pretty clear as you look across Christianity, you'll notice by and large, we do not keep Saturday as a holy day. I'm guessing that for most of us, we weren't setting apart yesterday like would have been done in Old Testament times or even anything loosely similar to that. So is the church in sin? Are we breaking the fourth commandment in not observing Saturday? Well, the confession of faith continues by sort of answering that or giving our, at least our position about the Sabbath. It says, the Sabbath which from the beginning of the world to the resurrection of Christ was the last day of the week and from the resurrection of Christ was changed into the first day of the week, which in scripture is called the Lord's day and is to be continued to the end of the world as the Christian Sabbath. So that's our confession of faith. You've got something pretty much almost word for word identical in the, the London Baptist confession of 1689. These, these reformed confessions, they articulate the position that the Sabbath was ordained by God as the last day of the week from creation right to the resurrection of Christ and then was changed to become the first day of the week. And today, if we're going to consider this fourth commandment, this idea of Sabbath keeping, well, we have to address this question. Why do we worship today on what is known as the Lord's Day or what our confession calls the Christian Sabbath? Why do we not worship on the Old Testament Sabbath day? Now, before we get into that, can I just make a brief comment on the, the term Sabbath? Uh, whenever I, I speak about the Christian Sabbath, I, I want to be clear what I mean by that. Uh, you'll see the word Sabbath used in two main ways in the Bible. Uh, firstly, the term is commonly used to refer to the seventh day of the week. Uh, that's, that's simply because Sabbath as a term has been so tied to that day throughout history, uh, certainly throughout biblical history. So quite often the word is just used as a regular word essentially meaning the seventh day of the week. Uh, that's sort of like how we use the word Saturday. You know, whenever you say Saturday, you're not using its original meaning. You're not, you're not talking about the day of Saturn. You certainly have no idea in your mind about worshiping Saturn on Saturday, but you use that term because it's just become the, the normal term that we used to, to speak of that day. And scripture uses Sabbath like that quite often, just using the term to speak about the seventh day of the week. You'll see that in the book of Acts regularly. It speaks about the Sabbath in that manner. It's referring to the seventh day of the week, and it's not that that day is the church's day of worship anymore. It's simply that the term Sabbath is so associated with that particular day of the week. It gets known as that the same way as Saturn gets so associated with our last day of the week, with Saturday. But then the other way in which the term is used has more to do with its actual meaning. See, the term Sabbath does not mean seventh. It doesn't mean seventh day of the week. It means to rest. That's the meaning. That's the basic meaning of the word, to rest. Uh, while the term is normally used in the Bible to refer to the seventh day of the week, the day of, uh, which was the day of rest in the Old Testament times, yet it is used more broadly than that to speak of any kind of particularly any kind of holy rest day that there was. Uh, for example, in Leviticus 16, verse 31, uh, when the Lord gave instruction for the day of atonement, the tenth day of the seventh month, which 
of course, was not going to be a Saturday every year. It, it varied based on the year. But the tenth day of the seventh month, the Lord specified the day was to be a Sabbath of rest unto you. Sabbath was an appropriate word for that day, no matter what day it fell on, because it was a special day of rest, regardless of the day of week. Now, there are some today who don't really like to speak about the Christian Sabbath, and I suppose I can understand that. Maybe there's a fear of it being confused. Um, they prefer to simply talk about the Lord's Day, which is perfectly fine because the Lord's Day is the term that the Bible does use for the Christian day of worship. It is the Lord's Day. But the point I'm making is that Sabbath simply means rest. And I think it is helpful to speak about the Christian Sabbath, the Christian rest day, because it emphasizes the church today is striving to keep the fourth commandment as we set apart the first day of the week. Whenever I speak about the Christian Sabbath, I'm using it in that sense, the day of rest. And it emphasizes that for the Christian today, we're to keep Sabbath, a holy day of rest, on the first day of the week. So, so let's get into it. Let's consider the change of the Sabbath, the change of the Sabbath. Uh, first of all, let's think about the legitimacy of the change. Uh, can, can anything be changed about this moral law? Is it possible for anything to be adapted? Is it appropriate that the enduring commandment of God might be somewhat flexible? Uh, well, I would ask you to turn to Ephesians 6. And from verse 1, the Apostle Paul is urging the children of Ephesus to obey their parents. And he says, children, obey your parents in the Lord for this is right. And he quotes from the fifth commandment, honor thy father and thy mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with thee and that thou mayest live long on the earth. Now Paul's obviously referring to the fifth commandment there, not the fourth. But I want to point out that Paul has adapted the language of the fifth commandment. In its original setting in Exodus 20, God gave the promise that as Israelites honor their father and mother, their days would be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. The promise of that commandment related to Israel, the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. But when Paul applies it to Gentile believers in Ephesus, he adapts the promise. Under the inspiration of God, there's nothing wrong with this. And he applies it in a New Testament context, not literally referring to the land of Israel, but instead to the earth in general. And the point is that there, with the fifth commandment, when Paul maintains the actual teaching of the commandment, children are still to honour their parents, and Paul points to that commandment as his authority. Yet, while the, the commandment still stands, he's able to adapt uh, it uh, for the New Testament church. Now, now, likewise here, I would put it to you, it is appropriate that the actual teaching of the fourth commandment is upheld, this pattern of six days labor, one day of rest, and yet it can be adapted for the New Testament church. Of course, as we saw last time, the day belongs to God. He is the Lord of the Sabbath. It is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. And Christ himself declares himself to be the Lord of the Sabbath. And as the Lord of the Sabbath, he has the sovereign right to adapt this commandment for the New Testament church. Now, we're not to expect that God will just cancel the fourth commandment. Uh, we, we dealt with that theme last week. It's part of moral, natural law. To be honest, if you don't agree there that the commandment is not cancelled, then you're probably going to disagree with everything else I'm about to say because it's all built on this idea. The Sabbath principle endures. We, we dealt with that last time. It's given for our good. It's moral, natural law. But the Lord has the right to adapt it while still maintaining the whole purpose and the teaching of it. God can legitimately change the day of rest. Well, then let's consider the evidence for a change of the Sabbath. The, the evidence. If you've ever been in a discussion with people like the Seventh-day Adventists or maybe Seventh-day Baptists, you'll probably have heard that the New Testament church continued to worship on the seventh day of the week right until the time of Constantine, the first Roman Empire to at least outwardly, I don't know his heart, but at least outwardly convert to Christianity. And the argument goes, you'll find that on the 7th of March, 321 AD, 
he issued a civil decree making Sunday the day of rest for the Roman Empire. And there was such a decree. It stated, all judges and city people and the craftsmen shall rest upon the venerable day of the sun. And it went on to give some allowance for farmers and uh, people like that who had to attend their land. Now, it's absolutely true. He did make a decree for the Roman Empire. But there's no reason to say that he changed the day. Uh, rather, I would put it to you that the church had already recognized the changed day, and he simply brought the empire into line with the church. In, in Northern Ireland, where I grew up, uh, parts of the, the Sunday Observance Act of 1695 are still in effect today. Not as much as there used to be, but some parts of it. Uh, shops have specific limits put upon their opening times. And when I was younger, I still remember a day when nearly all the shops were closed uh, on the Lord's Day. Now, when those laws came in, it was not that the government in, in Britain was shaping the church's theology. Rather, it was the church's theology that was shaping government and society. And that was the case with Constantine in AD 74, when the Apostle John was still likely alive, you have a document called the Epistle of Barnabas. It was esteemed by the church. It wasn't scripture, but it was held up as something valuable by the church. And it pointed to the significance of what it called the eighth day in the Old Testament and said that instead of keeping the Jewish Sabbath, Saturday, we keep the eighth day with joyfulness, the day also on which Jesus rose again from the dead. And when he had manifested himself, he ascended into the heavens. That's from the time when the Apostle John is likely still alive and it's saying, we keep the eighth day, the day in which Christ rose. Uh, Justin Martyr uh, wrote in AD uh, 155, described what the worship of the church looked like in, in his place. And he said, Sunday is the day on which we all hold our common assembly because it is the first day on which God, having wrought a change in the darkness and matter, made the world and Jesus Christ, our Savior, on the same day rose from the dead. Now, that's just a couple of examples, and I want to move on from it because it's not scripture. It's just quotes from church fathers. But the point is that when some claim that Constantine changed the day, here you have New Testament believers from about 200 years before he was even alive, and they're already recognizing the day we worship is Sunday. It's the first day of the week. Now, where do they get that view from? Where do we get that view from? We certainly don't have a direct statement in the New Testament saying, you know, thus saith the Lord, now you'll worship on the first day of the week. But, you know, in, in all sorts of areas, we, we draw our understanding of doctrine not just from explicit commands of Scripture, but also from the, the example, the pattern that is shown us in the Word of God. And Scripture does give us evidence for this change. In the Bible, you see that the New Testament church began to meet on the first day of the week. Uh, prior to that, it was the seventh day that was the day for gathering and for worshiping God. But the church instead began to gather on the first day. In Acts chapter 20, Acts 20 is teaching about Paul's missionary journeys. We're told that he, he came to the city of Troas, uh, this was part of a larger journey. He was, he was on his way to Jerusalem. In fact, it says in verse 16 of Acts 20, he determined to sail by Ephesus because he would not spend the time in Asia. He hasted, he's in a rush, if it were possible for him to be at Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost. So here's Paul, he's traveling, he's in a rush, he's trying to get back to Jerusalem in time for the day of Pentecost. And yet it's interesting that while he's in a rush, according to verse 6, he stayed for seven whole days in the city of Troas. And why did he spend seven days there? Well, it's quite likely that he's waiting until the church would be gathered. Verse seven declares, upon the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached unto them, ready to depart on the morrow. Paul waited, he's in a rush, but he waits these seven days. And then the first day of the week arrives and the church assembles. And it's clear that they're assembling for worship. They come to break bread. It, it quite likely refers to the Lord's table. But even if it doesn't, they come together for preaching. There's Paul preaching to them. It's a worship service on the first day of the week. And then the very next morning, being in a rush, Paul doesn't waste any time. He gets on the ship and, he, and off he goes 
on his journey to Jerusalem. Though in a rush, he waits to minister to the gathered church, and in order to do so, he has to wait for the first day of the week. Uh, then consider 1 Corinthians 16. Uh, here Paul is urging the people of Corinth to lay aside financially uh, to meet some of the urgent needs faced by the church at Jerusalem. Paul urges them to do the same things as are being done by the churches in Galatia, which is that in 1 Corinthians 16, verse 2, Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store, as God hath prospered him, that there be no gatherings when I come. Now, they're to bring their gifts. It's a practical matter. They're to bring financially uh, to try and meet the need for the church in Jerusalem, which is going through hard times. But they're to bring their gifts on the first day of the week. And, and why the first day? Well, it's not spelled out for us, but what's, I suppose, almost assumed, what's implied, is that that's the day on which the church will be gathering. That's the day in which the people will be coming together to worship the Lord. So that's the day it makes sense to bring their gifts and to gather them together and have them all brought to one place. This was the practice at Corinth, the Greek city. It was also the practice in Galatia, a city in Asia Minor. It was the practice of the church across the world to gather themselves physically on the first day of the week. Now again, in the Old Testament times, the Saturday Sabbath was the time for public worship. That's when men gathered together because that was the day set apart by God. Well, now you find the New Testament church and they're gathering not on the old Sabbath day, but on the first day of the week. In fact, in the book of Acts, you do see Paul going into the synagogue on the, the, the last day of the week. But you'll notice from his preaching, it's always evangelistic. It's always evangelistic. He's going into these synagogues, not, not to worship the Lord with them. They have a totally different basis. These people are rejecting Christ. He goes in and he's evangelistic. He's urging them to come on to Christ. He's urging them to believe the gospel. It's evangelistic. Sunday, the first day of the week, the Lord's day. That was the day when the church gathered together for worship. That was the day set apart now. We might not have an explicit command in the New Testament saying, thus saith the Lord. Now you're to set apart the first day. But the principles are there which drive us to that conclusion. Keeping one day in seven holy unto God, it is part of our moral duty. It's part of natural law. It doesn't just pass away without any sort of comment from God. But the New Testament church obeys God by setting apart this new day, the first day. Well then, Finally, let's consider the reasons for a change of the Sabbath. The reasons. And I trust there's a little bit here that's more maybe devotional even and encouraging to our hearts as we think about the reasons for a change of the Sabbath. Uh, while Scripture doesn't give us an explicit and obvious statement, you know, here's why it's changed. There are a number of things which certainly indicate for us why the New Testament church began to meet on the first day of the week, and to set aside that day for God's worship. Uh, firstly, and most obviously, the change in the day of rest is appropriate due to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. The fact that Christ rose on the first day of the week is reported by every gospel account. There's no doubt about it. It was the first day of the week. You know, I find it interesting that though, though there is debate today, about the day of Christ's crucifixion. And there is. There's debate. There will be people who say Christ died on a Wednesday, some, day, some say Thursday, some say Friday. There's debate. And it, you start looking into it, it is hard to give a, a very conclusive answer as to what day Christ was crucified on. That, that's not spelled out for us in the Bible. And yet, the day on which Christ rose is made absolutely clear. It was the first day of the week. It's put beyond all doubt. It's said over and over again. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, they all report it. Let me just quote John six, or sorry, Mark 16, verse 9. It says, When Jesus was risen early, the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he'd cast seven devils. But surely the fact that Christ rose from the dead on the first day of the week, and the fact that it's reported that way so clearly, emphasizes to us how important that event was for the church and how suitable it is that we should worship God 
on the first day. In fact, Revelation 1, speaks. John speaks about being in the Spirit on the Lord's Day. And by that phrase, the Lord's Day, it's very likely that in least, at least in part, he's referring to the day on which the Lord rose. It's the Lord's Day. It's the day on which he rose from the dead. John calls it the Lord's Day because Christ rose that day. The resurrection of Christ, it is central to our salvation. It's central to our standing before God. You know, his resurrection emphasizes to you the completion of Christ's redeeming work. It shows you that all is finished. It shows you that his sacrifice was enough to deal with our sins. It shows you that salvation is offered unto all those who will seek Christ. And it's appropriate that just as the Old Testament Sabbath marked the completion of God's work of creation, so too the, the New Testament day of rest would mark the completion of God's great work of redemption. Just as Christ rested from his, or just as God rested from his work of creation, uh, and that rest was marked by the keeping of Sabbath, how appropriate that on the day in which Christ uh, showed that he'd finished and could rest from his work of redemption, dying for the guilty, his sacrifice accepted, having been offered once for all, and accepted once for all, how, how appropriate that there should be a day to mark that rest. You know, this first day of the week is a day of celebration for us. Not just at Easter time, but every, sun, every Lord's Day. It's a day of celebration. As we gather together, one of the key things happening every week is we're marking the resurrection of Christ. And it's a weekly reminder to us that our Redeemer lives and that we have life through him. What a blessing this day is when you see it in that light. You know, Satan is accusing us throughout the week. He shows us our sins and our unworthiness to stand before God. He, says, he points out this thing and that thing, and he says, how can God ever accept you? And yet here we arrive on the first day of the week again, and it's a constant reminder that we have an advocate with the Father, one who has offered sacrifice for us, but one who has been raised. The sacrifice is accepted. He's raised, and he lives to intercede for us. And as Romans 8.34 asks, who is he that condemneth? And answers, it is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. This day reminds the child of God that none can condemn us because our Savior lives. We have an advocate with the Father. When Satan would tempt you to despair, uh, showing you your sin and saying, how can God accept you? You can look up and even rejoice on this day, marking it. Look up and see my Redeemer lives and he stands for me. Because he lives, I live in him. Tell me, are you able to rejoice today by faith as you consider what this day points to? The resurrection of the Redeemer. And have you taken hold of him by faith yourself? And are you able today to rest in his work and therefore able to rejoice today through faith that though your sins are many, yet they're forgiven? You have an advocate in heaven raised from the dead to represent you. Have you taken hold upon this Christ by faith? This is an appropriate, an appropriate new day of worship because through the resurrection of Christ, all things have been made new. And we have hope through him who has conquered the tomb. Then on top of that, we can say that the change in the day of rest is appropriate due to the pattern of the risen Christ. The pattern. Uh, whenever you read the gospel accounts, you'll find that initially it was the first day of the week that the Lord met with his people. And you see that especially in the gospel of John. Uh, we were reading from John chapter 20. A little bit earlier in John 20 John recounts the events immediately following the resurrection and he begins the chapter by stressing that it was the first day of the week he he records it was the first day of the week he speaks of how the Lord met Mary at the tomb and then following all of that account you come to verse 19 and John says again then the same day at evening being the first day of the week I notice he's emphasizing that again. When the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst. 
and said unto them, Peace be unto you. It's, it's this appearance that we're more interested in now as we think of John's gospel. And it's interesting to notice that although John has already told us that Christ rose from the dead on the first day of the week, although he's already told us in verse 19 that these things happened the same day, he re-emphasizes it, the first day of the week. He stresses that. And what happened on that first day of the week? The risen Christ came among his people. Here you have the people of Christ. They're gathered together. They're grieving in the upper room. When Christ comes and he meets with them on that day. And being the first day of the week, Christ comes into the midst and he has fellowship with his people and he declares unto them the reassuring words, peace be unto you. That's what they needed to hear. And that's something they could hear because he'd come back from the tomb, overcoming sin and death and hell. He can come and he can say, peace be unto you. And he reassures them. He shows them his wounded hands and his side. It's all on the first day of the week. Now, it's interesting to notice that one of the disciples, Thomas, was not there with the others. And he therefore doubted that the Lord was truly alive. Uh, that's why Thomas gets known as doubting Thomas. I think um, slightly harshly, because at other times Thomas shows great faith. But he gets called doubting Thomas for this event. He wasn't there on that first day, and he missed out on the presence of Christ. But now you think of it, the other disciples are rejoicing. They're, they're thrilled, they're glad in their soul, because they know that Christ is living. The Savior they've been following, the one who, in whom all their hopes are wrapped up, he lives. They're rejoicing. And yet, here's one of Christ's people, and he's still miserable. He's in the depths of despair, because as far as he's concerned, Christ is still dead. He doesn't believe that Christ is risen and he's, he's still grieving. He's still in the same state that the others were in before Christ met with them. Now Christ could have come to Thomas and reassured him at any point in the days to come. Christ could have appeared to him and reassured him on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday or Saturday. But the Lord didn't do that. He, he waited until the next Sunday, the, the next first day of the week. Uh, John tells us in verse 26, he says, and after, this is after the events of that first Sabbath, he says, and after eight days, again, his disciples were within and Thomas with them. Then came Jesus, the doors being shut and stood in the midst and said, peace be unto you. Now, for the sake of time, I'm not going to try and prove it now, although I can show you from scripture some other time if you want. But when the Jews counted days, they usually included the current day as day one which, by the way, is one of the key arguments for Christ being crucified on Friday. Um, some object to a Friday crucifixion, saying, well, the Bible speaks of him being dead for three days, and if he was crucified on Friday, how is he raised on Sunday? That's only like two days. Well, the Jews usually counted the current day as day one. So if we're talking about the distance in time between today and Tuesday, we would say Tuesday is in two days, Monday, Tuesday, for the Jews at that time, however, they would say Tuesday is in three days. They'd say Sunday, Monday, Tuesday. They'd count today as day one. So when John says there that eight days passed, he's bringing us to the next Sunday. He's bringing us again right the way through a week to the first day of the week. And once again on the first day of the week, the people are gathered together and the Lord comes to his gathered church. And this time Thomas is with them. The Lord didn't come to him separately some other day. The Lord waited and came on the first day of the week. And on that first day, the Lord reassured Thomas and again said to him, Peace be unto you. And showed Thomas his wounded hands and sighed. Now there would be other times when Christ met with his disciples and we're not told what day of the week it was. But we know that these first two occasions, the Lord came to his people on the Lord's day. And on the Lord's day, he stood in their midst and he showed his wounds and he assured them of the peace that they had through him. In doing so, he establishes the pattern that as his people meet one with another on the first day of the week to worship God, this is the special time that Christ comes and meets with them. In fact, even add to that, you take Revelation 1, that pattern shows itself again because there's John and he's in the spirit on the Lord's day. And what happens? The Lord comes and meets with him. Now, of course, John wasn't part of a gathered church that day. He was on his own 
in the Isle of Patmos, but still, the Lord comes and meets with him on that day and makes clear to us that it was on that day, the day belonging to the Lord. What a pattern that is, and particularly as it relates to the public gathering of God's people. You know, when we come, up, come apart from other things on this first day and, and we gather ourselves together, we can expect Christ himself to be in our midst, ministering to our needs through the gospel, as it were, showing us his wounded hands and his side. We can expect Christ to come through the gospel and to show us what he's accomplished and to show us that he lives and to reassure us and to declare to us, peace be unto you. What a blessing that is as we step aside from the other things and we come into the presence of God and we have the reassurances of the gospel again applied to our hearts. Peace be unto you. It's well with your soul because I live. Here I am wounded for you, risen for you. And by faith in me, you live, says the Savior. He is pleased to meet with us and reassure our hearts on this day. Let me point out one final reason for the change of the Sabbath day. And that is that the change of the day is appropriate due to the pouring out of the Spirit. Uh, according to Acts 2, verses 1 to 4, it, it was on the day of Pentecost that the Holy Spirit was poured out upon the Lord's people. And that was the event that really led the church to take off in its New Testament form. But it happened, it all began on the day of Pentecost. Now, Pentecost was a festival belonging to the Old Testament system, and the name literally refers to 50th, the 50th day, Pente, the 50th day. Uh, the 50th day after the, the Sabbath day which connected to the Feast of first fruits, if I'm right. Um, because the day came 50 days after the Jewish Sabbath, well, that gives you seven weeks. I don't know how good your maths is, but seven times seven is 49. And then you've got one extra day, 50, takes you to the first day of the week. So there we have another first day of the week. And according to Acts 2, it's on this day when the people of the Lord were all together with one accord in one place, and there they are, gathered for the worship of God, rejoicing in the risen Savior, and the Lord pours out his Spirit upon them and equips them for the task of global evangelism, fills them so that they might be his instruments in the building of the church. Now again, how appropriate it is that we set aside and meet together on the first day of the week when God has put such significance upon it. You know, one of the great blessings of this day as we use it aright and all the more in the public place of worship, is that the Spirit of God is at work in our midst. Now, we're not expecting another Pentecost. That, that was a one-off special event. But the Spirit, having been poured out upon his church, we can come together today with the expectation that the Spirit of the living God will work in our midst and do for us all that is necessary and particularly apply his word, testifying of Christ, leading us into all truth, working in our hearts and producing fruits of godliness, convicting and challenging the lost. We can expect the spirit of God to come and to deal with us and work powerfully, I suppose at any time, but especially on this first day. What blessings there are for the people of God as we set apart the day. And come with gladness to rejoice in our risen Savior and step aside from the other things with the expectation Christ will meet with us. The risen, glorious Christ will meet with us by his Spirit. He will deal well with us, apply his truth to us, and work in our hearts and build his church. There are good reasons for this change of day. Good reasons for the emphasis put today on the first day of the week. And, you know, as I finish, can I, can I just stress how I think appropriate it is that for the New Testament church, we begin our week with a day of rest. You know, we haven't got there yet. We'll be looking at this, I'm sure, in time to come as we consider the fourth commandment. But one of the things the Sabbath does is to point us to the eternal rest that we have in Christ. Well, the message of the law summed up in the Ten Commandments it is essentially, do this and live. That's the, that's the message of the law. If you're trying to get to heaven by law keeping, that's the message of the law. Do this and live. And taken as bare commandments, the idea is, you work, you do everything well, and then at the end of it all, if you've done it, 
which of course none can, you could have rest. Now, no one is able to keep all the commandments. No one ever does enough, and therefore no one ever attains everlasting rest by that means. If you're trying to get to heaven that way, you're, you're going to fail miserably. But the gospel presents a different message. In the gospel, Christ provides us with our rest, first of all. Christ provides us with rest already. Now, of course, yes, there's, there's more of that rest to enter into in future. Yes, we'll, we'll even yet enter into the, the eternal rest of glory. But for the Christian, our rest has begun. It's begun in Christ, who has already accomplished all things for us. And we stand secure in him already. Already we have peace with God. Already we're justified. Already we have the beginnings of rest. The gospel invites us saying, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. I will give you rest. And we're assured of it already. And then from that, Christ ushers us on to work and to serve him. How appropriate then to model our week that we start with rest in Christ and go on into the work of the week from that starting place. The message of the law, as again I say, is work, 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 and then you might get your rest. That's appropriate for an Old Testament Sabbath. Do your six days of work and then you can rest. Well, we have a different principle. Here's your rest in Christ. Come on to me and live, says the Savior. Come and I'll give you rest. Come and I'll save you. And then flowing from that, step forward. Labor, serve in the strength that I supply. As Christ stands to give us rest, not just the first day of the week, but true rest in himself, I trust today that you know him and you know his salvation and you have the experience of that true rest that is supplied through him. May the Lord bless his word to us today and use it. Amen.